Hi, my name is Donnell Cannon. I am um, the current e executive director of Marine Joy Charter. Um, so I'm one of the presenters today, but equally, I'm really excited to hear from other, some, for a few of the other presenters. I geek out over their work. I nerd out over like what they're up to. So um, I'm really excited to, to continue to learn from them. And so um, to, to um, get us started, I just wanna make sure we had a set of like agreements that we can commit to during our time together to ensure that we get like, um, as much as possible out of the short time we have together. So a few of those um, the, those norms and agreements that we've set here uh, are listed on the screen. So our first is like participate in full. Um, we want, want you to hold the driver's seat. Um, so we wanna be present together while you're here so that you can like, again, like get as much out of that wet towel as possible. So we wanna squeeze that as like much as we can. Um, we wanna value differences. There, again, as we saw in the chat, like folks are coming from multiple spaces, uh, different types of communities, and each one of you have just so much to share and there's just so much perspective to, to surface. Um, so let's appreciate diversity and respect the differences that each uh, of you are bringing to, to this space um, to ensure that again, we get everything that we can uh, get out of it. We wanna take and reward risk. So we wanna hear the bold risk. We wanna hear that like folks who are putting them, uh, put themselves in positions um, to learn in public. Uh, so that, again, like we can continue to challenge ourselves and, um, and as, again, as learn as much as we can while we're here together. And then um, there's non-attribution -attrib in the breakout rooms. So we're recording the main spaces, but when we're heading to breakout rooms, um, we're not gonna we're not gonna have access to the recordings. Uh, so um, so like as we like come out of those breakout rooms after the session, we want to just keep uh, your colleagues' identities confidential. Let's hold a Vegas space. Um, so we want to create a space where folks can share like in a, like safely and um, and openly. Um, but we want to make sure that's as confidential as possible. And lastly, let's just have a good time. We're here together for uh, for a short time period. Let's make the most of it. Out of it. Let's bring as much um, much joy as we can. Um, so let's let's bring let's, let's be the joy we want to see in this space. So uh, Chelsea, you want to take us further? Thank you so much, Donnell. Um, I want to make sure I'm. Yes, I am not on mute. Um, thank you. I uh, I thought that Beth and I we are going to meet all of our presenters um, in the next few minutes, but um, Beth and I thought we might start here by um, just a little bit of context setting. We actually had a conversation a few weeks ago that we thought was sort of a good tee up for um, this session, and thought we might kind of have a similar conversation here in our first few minutes. So um, I'll just quickly start and say, um, it's so great to be here. My name is Chelsea Waite. I'm from the Center on Reinventing Public Education and I'm one of the co-leads of the Canopy Project, um, which we'll share a little bit more about later in the session. Um, but all of us here on the, as, as your hosts are involved with that project. And Beth, would you say a few words about yourself? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Rabbit. I have the pleasure of getting to lead the team at the Learning Accelerator. We're a national nonprofit and have been um, a research and learning partner to the Canopy Project, actually, since its beginning. Uh, in particular, we've been doing a lot of focus group work uh, to kind of understand what do users of the Canopy want to know about innovation and why and how can we make it really valuable. We also do a lot of work nationally trying to understand patterns of what people are learning and taking on. So really excited to get to hear from all of you today. Great. Well, so again, just to sort of tee up our conversation today, um, we thought we would start, first of all, by kind of recognizing you know, COVID is still with us. It's ever evolving and it's also so intertwined with many other social and economic and environmental challenges. And we know that every one of us in this room knows that students and educators and communities have been negatively impacted, including um, by many issues that that predated the pandemic that are that are sort of longstanding issues in our education system. And so Beth and I have been kind of watching as, you know, different recovery and innovation agendas are being defined kind of locally, nationally, and globally. So we've been, we've been watching how those evolve. And what have you seen, Beth? Yeah, I think from a national perspective, um, there is no clear universal agreement on what the agenda should be. Um, we are definitely listening and learning and seeing some trends I'll share. And the first, which should be obvious uh, based on the core of this conversation is there like innovation isn't the point. <laughs> innovation agendas actually live in service of recovery and transformation agendas, right? And so um, we've been doing a lot of work to try to understand what are the common or uncommon aims that communities are working towards. Um, and we found it really 
as important to talk about the why in this innovation work as much as the what. Um, Chelsea, I think you have a, a slide up next. So there is a really interesting report that just came out a couple of weeks ago out of the Brookings Institution. There's a scholar named Rebecca Winthrop and her team actually did a deep dive looking at internationally all of the different like um, learning and innovation agendas that they were seeing present in the field, particularly looking across um, UN nations. And what they, <coughs> excuse me, we're finding is that there's real consistency in, um, in kind of patterns of innovation, but people are prioritizing different things. The first thing, which I think is a real tension, which speaks to Chelsea's first point, is everyone is navigating um, choices between innovation for the purposes of recovery and responding to COVID in the urgent now versus um, actually needing to think about longer term transformation. And what Rebecca's team saw is actually the um, creation of camps focusing on those two aims. What's interesting is that like those two goals are in fact not at all in competition, but communities are really working to figure out how to actually um, make their short-term innovation needs actually connect to their goals for long-term transformation versus being separate. The other thing is that they saw these six themes um, around kind of the the why of like what people are trying to produce, as well as the way they're trying to produce them. So different organizations are focused on foundational learning versus well-being and whole child development versus workforce were sort of three big themes versus approaches people were taking were really around like leading through equity and inclusion efforts versus um, leveraging technology and other infrastructure to speed up adoption and the scaling of things to actually like redefining who's getting to make decisions and push forward learning agendas. Her team actually identified real differences in how actors working at different levels. So the national or global level versus the um, the local level in terms of how people are prioritizing the work. And the amazing thing is that like everybody is very strongly prioritizing equity and inclusion in this moment, but there are actually real differences. Um, global actors tend to be focusing more on the instrumental aspects of scaling technology versus local actors are really pushing on kind of redefining how local communities get to um, state purpose and take power over what innovation is happening. And a big takeaway is that actually um, we need to have conversations about differences in agenda and differences in ways we're gonna be acting if we're gonna move forward together. It's so interesting to see this international perspective and it, it really resonates because we also see you know, in the US that the ways that state and federal governments or, you know, national funders talk about innovation isn't always the exact same as the way that school leaders and communities talk about it. Um, and so that's, that's actually going to be like a big focus of our conversation all together today. And the reason that we have these four amazing school leaders in the room to talk about the way that they think about innovation. Um, just to, to sort of zoom out and complement what we're about to hear, um, we saw that in the Canopy Project, which recently analyzed data on innovative school designs from 161 schools all across the country, including the four folks that, um, that you're going to hear from today. Um, and we saw a really wide range of approaches to innovation in this moment, from practices that are advancing educational justice and student well-being to practices that are designed to enable you know, highly flexible and individualized learning environments. And so one kind of big takeaway from looking at the trends in that data set is that innovation isn't just sort of what's new or what's different. Um, it's actually a way of addressing inequities by really centering local community strengths and needs. Yeah, and just to, to add on to that, some things that we've heard from focus groups and other conversations is actually the ways that we're willing to define innovation um, really matter and how open we are to actually letting um, local community, local entities or broader um, affiliative communities actually define what's important. Um, we've been doing a lot of work at TLA to get outside the echo chamber a little bit to actually talk to equity organizations that are serving communities, but not as education organizations. So places like the National Urban League or the Congressional Hispanic Caucus say like, what? what is education doing right versus wrong for you in this moment? Like what should the innovation agenda be? Not surprisingly, different communities have really distinct needs and ways of looking at that work. But um, the common message uh, that we heard loud and clear is that we actually have to pay a lot more 
attention to local community priorities right now. Um, we haven't done a great job of that in the past. In order to move forward through recovery to transformation, we have to do that even more. We also need to be a whole lot precious about what we consider innovative. During one of our focus groups, one of the um, members had said, like, I think we should stop using this term because it means so much to so many people. And further, it can actually, in some ways, marginalize folks who aren't labeling their work as innovative when it is incredibly innovative. Um, so one thing we're also thinking a lot about is how do we actually allow communities to define like what innovation means to them and what aims they want to achieve? And further, how do we make sure we're recognizing differences in how communities are innovating, even if they aren't using that label for their work? Because there's amazing work happening. Um, school leaders are at the intersection of these conversations. Um, between community, family, and student. And we actually think this is why we have to have the conversation today, learn more about how school leaders are approaching this work. Yes, I'm so excited for the conversation. So we are gonna spend most of our session today digging into how school leaders, both our presenters and um, folks in the room are defining innovation in your communities and how you go about learning what you need to know when you're undertaking this really important work of recovery and transformation. So the first thing we're gonna do is start by hearing from our four school leaders who are in the room and I'll pass it off to them soon to introduce themselves and share for about five minutes each about their um, about what innovation means to them. Um, and while they are sharing, one thing I wanted to ask of the group is that you actively use the chat to kind of reflect back and echo back some of the words and phrases and ideas that you're hearing that really resonate with you and really stick out to you. So let's use that chat as a place to sort of echo back these exciting ideas that we're hearing from folks. And then we will um, move into breakout rooms where we'd love for everybody to sort of discuss this concept, especially folks who are working in schools. Like what, what does innovation mean in your community and where do you go to learn what you need to know when you're trying to figure out something new? Um, so, um, I will go ahead and pass it off um, to our four school leaders and we'll start with Alexa um, from Concourse Village Elementary School. Um, and I'm just so excited for this conversation because as Donnell has reflected before, you know, all these four school communities share some intersection points, but they also, in Donnell's words, sort of swerve from each other. Um, so really excited for you to, to get to hear some of these conversations and use that chat actively to echo back. Alexa, I will pass it off to you. Good morning and good afternoon, because depending on where you're located. Um, so I'm Alexa Sordan, the founding principal of Concourse Village Elementary School. It's located in the South Bronx, so New York City. I'm part of one of about 1,800 schools in the Department of Education. And, when, and um, it's funny, while Beth was just saying like how some folks may feel weary about that word innovation because it sounds like this really big word and it sounds like if I'm innovating I have to be doing something that no one has ever heard of ever in the history of education. So when I think about what innovation means to us in, a, in, in our community, I always look at it as taking ideas and um, either coming up with something brand new or improving something that already exists. So that's what makes the word, I guess, um, less threatening or less, um, makes it more attainable for us as a community. So when we think about innovation, we're like, well, if we looked at our school schedule, what would that mean for us if we wanted to be more innovative? If, and which goes along with the idea of taking risks and trying new things. And where do we get that push from? Our scholars. So usually we look and we say, um, it, I think we need to try something new. I'm noticing that many students are maybe showing up compliant and that's something that we don't want. So how can we be more innovative in terms of our school scheduling? How can we be more innovative with our curriculum? So that's what it means at Concourse Village. And I just would like to add um, some examples of what innovation looks like for us. So, we're departmentalized in grades K through five. So we took a risk. We're like children from kindergarten all the way to fifth grade will change classes and they'll have a math, ELA and science, te a, a humanities teacher, a science teacher and a math teacher. And they'll switch throughout the day, their classes. And what prompted that was actually COVID. We, we thought about 
how many students were learning at home and they had the freedom of learning in their pajamas and getting up as often as they needed and pausing and taking breaks. So we're like, what if we looked at our schedule and looked at ways to create more movement throughout the day, um, change up the environment, uh, change up the teacher. Uh, teachers teach with different energy and different, um, they have a different style to how they approach learning. So that was the first step we took. We said, we're going to do that. Um, we also went back and we looked at blended learning practices and thought about, well, we were using flipped classroom so that we could maximize our time online. We should be doing that as well in person. So what are some of the things that should be flipped that the children go home, review, um, and study for so that we could have a more robust conversation in the classroom. Then of course that prompted us to think about, well, um, what do our tasks really look like? And we say real world learning, hands-on learning, but are they truly interacting with org organizations outside of the school or are they all just simulations? Pretend you're writing to the National Geographic, pretend that the New York Times is getting this article and write an essay, is that really innovative? Or do we start to look at our curriculum and see pockets of opportunity within our own community and our own community for our students to actually apply their knowledge? So an example of that could be if they're learning how to be a good citizen in first grade, well, what does that look like outside? Um, what, does that, how, what does it look like to be a good citizen actually in your community, in your school, in your neighborhood? So that's what innovation means um, at Concourse Village. Thank you so much, Alexa. You can see, you can check out the chat. People have been reflecting back different ideas that you shared. Um, and let's move forward to our, to our next school leader here, um, Donnell. You're up next. Hey, Alexa, thanks for sharing that. Um, I like totally connect with like that idea of like borrowing some things and putting some rims on the wheels, you know, with some new, real, new rims on the wheels. I've done some of that, like learning with like Miguel and, and Tyler and have certainly borrowed some of their practices and defined it in our context. So yes, um, all game. And so um, I am the executive director of Marine Joy, but previously the co-founder of the North Phillips School of Innovation. Um, it's uh, we started with a micro school and scaled across um, like uh, middle school and, and, and our free, uh, high school. Uh, some some new practices that we believe like better work for young people. Um, it's in a small community in rural North Carolina. And so, what innovation I guess means for for our community is um, we don't just see like innovation as doing something different. Like we see innovation as like like a clear process and tool to like building towards. Um, more equitable and like uh, liberatory models um, in partnership with young people. And so we don't just see it like for innovation's sake, right? It's like, it's, I believe is our only direct route to ensuring like young people have more equitable experiences in school, but also able to better define like what a good life for themselves like look like beyond um, the, the, the traditional educational experience. Um, I think our community has been wrestling for a while with this idea, this realization um, that the like the industrial model of schooling um, just won't ever bring us like equity because it was like in many ways just like never like created for that. And so as such, like in order to um, ask the, the model to produce us like, like equitable experiences for especially for black and brown babies, then we needed to build towards a new, which also means like moving closer to better understanding our, our young people's lived experiences in the world and um, their life context and use that as like a, a, a place to like design new models. And for us, we came out of like our work with our young people to better def define like one, what's a good life for them? And then how do we like, what are the set of experiences they need to like access that level of good life? Um, we've like defined our experiences around like their passion and purpose. So helping our students like really define that. So we created a curriculum um, well, across across our school, our young people get to like really like double down on their their uh, passions, like really explore that. They have opportunity to like release that if it like doesn't work for them, or like continue further if like they the new the, that new passion like feels like what they want to be up to in the world. Um, this that we also have like a real world uh, real world instruction. So we've like we've moved towards like an um in a. In a more of like an advisory based and internship based model so that young people kind of get like a sample size of like what they want to be up to and have an opportunity to continue to explore that if that feels like unique to like what they want to be up to and kind of look 
as to how they define a good life. And so like most of like believe innovation is like, how do we partner with our young people and their families to define like what are the set of experiences that um, young people like would need to have to access a good life. And that's what we believe is like the driver of that. And so that's, again, that's how our community thinks about how we pursue innovation. But uh, like ultimately though, like we believe like innovation is our, our direct route to creating the equity we wanna see in our schools. I love that. Thank you so much. And y'all are like, I thought I was going to have to keep time, but y'all are moving pretty quickly. Can I ask you, Donnell, just to reflect a little bit too about like, how, how do you go about learning how to do what you described? Start sort of starting yeah. with the, yeah. Yeah, so similar to, I think, what Alexa shared is that, like, just always curious about, like, what are, like, other, like, leaders, like, up to in, in their community context. So sometimes that means, like, like the small inspiration visits or, like, simple calls with, like, um, some some friends, like Tyler. Like, we had a chance to sit with Tyler a few months ago and just ask him about, like, what what is he, how is he leading his work for young people? How is he thinking about it, right? And what is, like, what has emerged out of, like, um, some of his learning? And so that has like helped us to think broader about like what could be possible for our young people. And some of that is like uh, like the empathy interviews, like really sitting with young people and grandmamas on front porches and just asking like, like what lights your young person up in the world or asking a young person that directly. Uh, some of that is like, when are you happy? When are you the happiest at school? Right? Like, what do you, what, how do you define a good life? Right? And so what experiences would you like to have to help you be, um, to move closer to like the good life as defined by you? And so a lot of it is just like spending time with families, um, shadowing young people um, and making this little set of observations that can lead us to some deep insights that allow us to kind of use as like fodder for, for, um, for our design. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. Let's hear next from Miguel. There we go. Thanks, Chelsea um, and Donnell and Alexa. It's it's really funny because uh, you know each of us have you know approximately five minutes to talk about what we're doing. And as I'm hearing uh, Alexa and Donnell talk, I'm like, shoot, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> because like the brilliance that they that they have, I feel like in some ways I'm going to see simply uh, repeating some of their their brilliance. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I am the the founder of Embark Education. Uh, which is a micro middle school embedded in two small businesses in Denver, Colorado. Um, our school is literally a coffee shop and a bike shop that is directly at the intersection of community and learning. Um, so as you know, we built Embark, um, we built it directly with community, right? In community. One of our spaces that we think about um, innovation is, you know, really thinking about um, you know, I think of I think of like education and learning happening in a, in a tripod, right? And um, the, the three areas of learning are the learner, the educator, and the environment. And you can innovate at the intersection of all of those things or at each of the points along the way. And, you know, Embark, um, when we think about our environment, we really started to, to break down the barrier between, um, between the learning and the environment, right? So, as our students interact in the coffee shop and you know they might be reading or writing um, literally at a coffee shop table alongside, you know, we have a reporter from USA Today who's oftentimes in the coffee shop writing. And all of a sudden our, you know, our learners have this opportunity um, to, to turn and, and, and talk to this reporter who's writing for a national newspaper. Or, you know, our students were contemplating um, you know, how they could paint a mural on a big brick wall. Um, that we have outside. And as they're brainstorming this, you know, next to them um, leans over, you know, the director of a local art collective and um, leans over and, and, you know, says, hey, I think we could partner on this. And all of a sudden what happens is the innovation shifts from, you know, what is the curriculum that we're delivering to how do we support this learning to be meaningful? And how do we as educators step back into a supporting role at the direct intersection of community and learners, right? That's really a space where innovation can can truly happen when we step when we step beyond the walls of, you know, the confines of the four walls of a school, and we start to think about learning happening in community and with community um, has been a really powerful place for us. Um, along those lines, you know, we've also really thought about, um, you know, in the as we work to be um, embedded in these two small businesses. Alexa put this beautifully um, when she was sharing around, like we don't do anything for pretend. Right. 
we have an opportunity in a context in which it's just truly real world learning. And so one of the things that we did at Embark is we oftentimes talk about it as finding the intersection of this, the speed of learning and the speed of business. And those are two very different things. And as we've been working to, to uncover that, um, you know, we've, we've really learned that we're not really preparing our students for what's ahead. We're preparing for our students for what is now, right? Oftentimes in, um, you know, in education, especially in middle school, which is in Barkas, it's like, oh, we're preparing you for high school or we're preparing you for college. Well, like what happens when we start preparing students to live their lives now as best as they possibly can? And then they're ready for high school, right? When we change our goal, when we change our viewpoints from, you know, what success looks like is being ready for high school to success looking like I'm supporting a student to understand who they are and how they fit into the world, then we're talking about some innovation, right? Then we're talking about, you know, how we can change the orientation to, to the world around us. Um, and so thinking for us, you know, again, around how we're doing that when thinking about how we're intersecting and innovating in the space between the learner and the educator, the educator in the environment, in all the spaces in between, right? One of the questions that we've been able to, to do, and if you've heard me share before, um, you know, either in a, in a conference or something along those lines, like one of the things I oftentimes come back to is that innovation can be, can be daunting as Alexa and Donnell shared, but one of the things that I really helped us um, innovate is, is answering what I call the, the three learner-centered questions, um, which I did not come up with. I am um, fortunate to have come across them. But it's really asking ourselves the questions like, what are we doing that students could be doing? What are the student, what are we doing that students should be doing? And then how do we create the context for those two things to be true? Right. And if we use those questions, what are we doing that they could be doing? They should be doing. And then how do we create the context to be true? We're going to be finding spaces of innovation left and right. And we can innovate in our classrooms, in our schools, in our districts in our country and whatever that might be, um, because it, it does come down to, to us asking us some simple questions um, and how we guide the space forward. Thank you so much. All kinds of reflection back in the chat for you there and, and for all of us in our ongoing reflections. Thanks, Miguel. And lastly, I will pass it to Tyler and um, I'm also gonna make sure, yeah, perfect. Great, Tyler, Mike is yours. Awesome, thanks. Miguel, I love the emphasis on uh, flourishing. It isn't something for the future, but for now. And uh, I think I heard, I don't know if it was a therapist or a counselor talk about this idea of future tripping. Just say you're future tripping, you, you know, the focus should be on, you know, now and, and preparing ourselves and, and learners for, for now. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be with you all. My, my name is Tyler Thigpen. Uh, I've been massive uh, fans of Donnell's and Miguel's work for a minute and a recent fan of uh, Alexis's work. Um, I lead uh, the Institute for Self-Directed Learning. Uh, we're based in Atlanta, uh, as well as the four schools, which is an in-person pre-K through grade 12, um, independent, intentionally diverse uh, environment, as well as an online uh, school that has learners from all four US time zones, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Costa Rica, Mexico. Um, and uh, you know, when, when we think about what innovation means to our community, I mean, we, we feel like our, we think about our mission you know, which is around purpose education and helping each person who enters our doors find a calling that will change the world. And we feel like with our parents and our learners, we've set aside some graduate aims, some things that we want to be true of our 18 year olds by the time they graduate from us and then work backwards from that. And we feel like that just that has kind of set the foundation for some innovation, innovative signature learning experiences. I think we also, when it comes to innovation, think about key features and practices. And I've dropped a few features um, in the chat, you know, we we have guides, Socratic guides instead of teachers, um, you know, mixed stage studios instead of classrooms. Um, so, so just basically trying to identify some key features of our model. But in terms of keeping the innovation going, uh, you know, we do weekly surveys with our parents and learners, asking them how we're doing and how they're experiencing our learning environment. And then we respond in one of three ways. I mean, if it's good feedback and mission aligned, we'll make the change and share that with the whole community. If it's uh, without, you know, if it's if it's emotional venting, we'll ignore it because there's nothing we can do. Um, and if it's uh, uh, if it's if it's um, uh, something that we can't do or it's not aligned with our mission, um, then we'll let the community know, um, you know, have a follow up conversation. Um, we also do a lot of design sprints. 
um, to create new uh, processes, system structures, um, you know, signature learning experiences. Uh, we regularly do that with learners, with parents, with staff. Um, and then we try and celebrate, celebrate what we want to cultivate. Um, uh, and, you know, for, because it, we, we believe that if we do celebrate it, we're going to cultivate it. Um, when, in terms of like what we learned from when developing the design of our school, um, we, we really tried to listen hard to the dreams of parents and learners. Um, we listened to a lot of the local leaders of social institutions. So our mayor, the head of the NAACP, the leaders of socialist, you know, like churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, um, you know, apartment uh, complex leaders, uh, um, sports leaders to just, you know, get a, get, a, get a pulse and also share our vision and invite folks in. Um, we learned a lot from networks. Uh, when founding our school, you know, we're a part of an Acton network, which is global, uh, Transcends Design Community, the Learning Accelerator, the Mastery Transcript Consortium are examples of networks we learned from. Um, and then we did a lot of research on other school models and even some inspiration visits, you know, to some of those models. Um, and the things we're still trying to figure out as it relates to innovation, you know, we, we uh, because it's a new learning model, we're always constantly thinking about trying to get buy-in, um, you know, from our constituency. Um, and and uh, you have an open, honest conversation about conviction for the model. Um, you know, we've got a big bet on self-directed learning and learner-led environments, learner-centered environments, learner-empowered environments in an intentionally diverse environment. And, you know, especially with neurodiverse learners, figuring out how to do that well uh, with nuanced supports, uh, something we're still trying to figure out. Um, you know, learning to live together is a key pillar, pillar of our school. Um, and so, you know, how we love one another um, and lean in across all, uh, you know, many different lines of difference, especially race, economic, age, gender, religion, and, and school background um, is what we're thinking about a lot. And then we're also trying to, we're, we're thinking a lot about trying to figure out building the capacity and a pipeline for guides uh, to do this work, um, you know, because there's not a whole lot of graduate schools of education, uh, and I teach in one uh, at UPenn, that are fully aligned with, um, you know, what it means to be a guide rather than a teacher. And then more broadly, you know, what's the research base for this work? A lot of what we're trying to do doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, qualitative or quantitative backing. So our institute's really looking at how through our seven year research agenda, can we, can we, you know, add to the conversation or inspire some more conversation around, you know, uh, learner empowered environments. So that's a little bit of how we're thinking about uh, these things. Thank you, Tyler. Well, we can't wait to have these conversations with you all. So um, Miguel, can I pass it to you and, and you can frame us up for our breakout room conversations? Yes, you can. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, this is just like already I'm, I'm like have goosebumps um, just listening to to everybody. So I'm I'm super excited to dig into, you know, just some small conversations with with everybody in the audience as well. Um, you know, because we've been sharing a lot about what innovation means uh, for us in, in our context and as we built um, some of our um, our communities and breathe life into the learning experiences for for youth. Um, and so, you know, now we're going to, um, you know, be thinking about how we how we engage with it um, as a community and we're going to start digging like digging our teeth into, um, you know, answering that question for us, like what does innovation mean in your community, because, you know, ultimately, none of us can do this alone. Right. We we oftentimes are working in education and we feel like we're just yelling into the void. And and truly, you know, what we need to be doing is doing this collectively. Right. It, we, you know, all of us on the panel have absolutely been learning together. You know, a lot of us have been um, in conversation, um, you know, being inspired by each other's work. Um, also, just like, you know, truly being a thought partnership, you know, Chelsea and the Canopy Project have brought together an incredible resource of um, of other innovative environments that we can learn um, from and with each other. So I'm um, excited to continue to to build out this community uh, with this group right now. And so we are about to break into to group, like breakout rooms um, and start to answer these questions together. Okay, so I'm happy to have all of our folks back together again. So we spent some time in our small groups um, talking about what innovation means um, in our community. We talked about our innovation growth edges, and we also talked about what we're trying to figure out. So we know that there's just so much learning involved when you're trying to lead innovation, when you're trying to 
implement innovation, when you're trying to be a part of something innovative. And we want to spend the last 10 minutes sharing resources. So the question is, where do you turn when you need to learn something new? So where do you turn to when you need to learn something new? You could feel free to come off the mute button. You can come off of mute and share out loud. And you could also continue to add to the Padlet. Can I ask a quick question um, that I asked in a small group? Um, and I heard that I heard all of, I think all of uh, the presenters discuss inspirational visits. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Because it sounds like something I want to be a part of. Yeah, I can, I'm happy to, to jump in um, on the inspiration visits. You know, I think that you can find inspiration in a lot of, a lot of different spaces. Um, you know, some of the things that we've chosen to do is, um, you know, to, to find different areas of inspiration within our own local community. And some of those, we, we find those from, um, from asking our community of like, what are, what are they up to? You know, I think it was Tyler who shared, um, different areas of community of learning, whether it's like churches or synagogues or after school programs or local food banks, like you can find a lot of inspiration in those spaces on your own. Um, but I will say one of the one of the things that's been curated for us as an educational community, and I saw this show up on my slide as well as somebody else's, is there's an incredible, um, a crema, a incredible opportunity called the Inspiration Project. Um, put on by Franklin Street Studios um, and the team over there. And they've actually really curated some really inspirational models and areas of learning um, from across the country. So I would definitely check that out um, if you're looking for an easy way to, to do that. And then obviously the Canopy Project, which is a huge piece too, um, gives a, a really great opportunity to tap into that network um, for inspiration as well. Maybe I'll just briefly for folks who don't no, share a little bit um, about if you haven't been to the Canopy Project website on canopyschools.org, I just want to briefly sort of show the, the data portal that's here. On the website, you're able to go into a map of all of the 308 schools that have shared information about how they are innovating and what innovation means to them. And you can, you know, scroll through here, but also really importantly, you can filter and sort. So by geographic location, by you know, the practice that the school is really focused on um, by student demographics. So just wanted to share that in case it's helpful as folks are um, looking for peers to learn from. I wonder if I could just share really quick about the exact path, is that okay? Awesome. Um, so uh, I was sharing, I believe it was Jenny that shared in her group that um, her in the school, in the classroom, they're struggling to like really challenge themselves to address the learning loss component. Um, and so I've actually worked um, in another um, innovative school that was servicing foster and um, homeless and um, juvenile justice youth who were getting pushed out of the school system, but obviously didn't also have um, the skills that they needed because of how um, they were in and out of the um, system due to their scenarios. Um, but there is a uh, a program on through Amentum um, called Exact Path, which uses traditional um, diagnostics. So if your school has to do MAT or NWA, but then they also have their own diagnostics that just allow you to kind of see where students are. Um, and currently in the program that I am at um, with Portal Schools, um, I'm working with my colleagues to use it not only to empower students to know exactly where they are, but also to give them that um, skill sets um, and lessons at their grade level and then challenging them as they're learning like, hey, I am a a sophomore, I have aspirations to go to college, but my reading levels are showing that I'm in the seventh grade. So I can give them um, various uh, assessments towards mastery um, at their the current grade level, but you can also challenge them as they're um, navigating and saying, hey, I want to be challenged, and you provide them with uh, a higher level. Um, and then you see 
again, their enthusiasm and actually challenging themselves and taking ownership of their learning. Um, but I do appreciate it because it is K through 12. Um, and it just allows you to truly um, empower students to know where they are. Um, and student, you can assign based off of your class. I'm a science teacher, and so I'm strengthening my students and letting them know um, language arts, reading, and math are important for my class. Um, and so uh, just trying to do some transdisciplinary work with students. But um, the platform um, is something that I'm navigating and using, so I just wanted to make sure I share that. Thanks for sharing that. I just put, I just wanted to draw folks attention quickly to the chat as we wrap up here. We would really appreciate just one minute on a feedback survey from the Aurora Institute on this session. Um, so click on that before you head out of the session, but um, otherwise, if, does anyone have any anything else they'd like to share in this last two or three minutes about where you're learning about uh, on some of these growth edges that Alexa mentioned. Well, I hope the Padlet, the Padlet is, has just been blowing up in my, um, from my view, I've been tracking it. So this is an amazing resource that we will definitely keep live. Um, and uh, maybe just in this last minute, I'll also say folks who, you know, my co-presenters, if you're open to keeping in touch with anybody on the call, throw your email address in the chat. Um, and uh, it's just been such a pleasure being with everybody today. And huge thank you to Beth, Miguel, Alexa, Tyler, and Donnell for, for joining me and everybody today to share more about the work that you're doing. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>